Now it's time to energize you all again and get your fingers flowing. So we're going to continue actually with the first. It's going to be a couple of poll questions that we would like for you to ask. And then also, of course, as I told you earlier, uh, what we also would like you to do is to ask your own questions. So I can bring them up. And we have some already that we're going to get your professors to answer. Uh, but let's bring up the first poll question. So, what it says is, given the facts in these presentations that we've just seen, would you agree that the technique of OSTEL has proven clinical values and a solid scientific background? That's so that's easy. an easy question. <laughs> Hopefully, either yes or no. And it's an interesting question for us, I think. It Maybe. sort of sums up <laughs> our message. Maybe. So let's see what we have. Wow. 100%. <laughs> oh, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, let's take the next one. How many are currently using the resonance frequency analysis technique to determine the degree of osteointegration? Osteo -integration. So it's yes or no, or if you're sort of considering it after listening to these lectures. So it's also sort of an interesting question. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> someone is sort of uncertain. Yeah. Also, around 50% of you are using the technique. Well, that's good. Yeah, and a lot of you are also considering to implement that technique. That's also very nice results, I think. So let's take the next one. So this goes back to, I think, more or less what questions you had in Peter Moy's lecture. So normally, how long do you wait before you load your implants? One to three months, three to six months, or more than six months? Yeah, and would you agree this sort of, it sort of touches upon the answers you had in your presentation, right? This was mo the most common answer, actually. Three to six mm -hmm. months seems to be the normal period of healing time that you apply when you use dental implants. So very few are saying more than six months. So the longer healing mm -hmm. periods are sort of more or less uh, diminishing. So that sort of touches upon what you said, Daniel. Uh, you're going from eight months all the way down to maybe eight weeks, which, of course, is a drastic step. Yeah, I would say, of course, we go from zero to yeah. four weeks, to eight weeks, to 12 weeks. Yeah. Right? Because the question is not put correctly, I would say. Because today we do the whole range. Huh? And for certain cases, we can do immediate restorations. We do it mainly in the aesthetic, in the uh, dentures cases, because they have a huge benefit for the patient. But when I do, a, let's say, a standard placement, that means everything is healed, then we often do it these days flapless, computer-assisted, and we put that implant at four weeks into final restoration. That is then for the patient extremely attractive because they don't have to pay for provisionals, they go straight to a final restoration. But that is only taking the decision when the ISQ value is really high. Yeah. And then you know at four weeks you can do it. And uh, GBR and sinus, well, we do often eight weeks and sometimes then longer as we have shown. So it's the whole range, depends on the situation. So let's bring a question here, maybe, then apply to what you're saying in your technique. Uh, let's see if I can improve this one. Uh, and can get you that modify question these questions now? <laughs> Want to t check him? Huh? <laughs> I'm sure we can. So it says here, well, it's anonymous, but it's pointed to you, then, Professor Busser. What torque protocol did you use? Uh, should I be very honest? Yes. Uh, now, uh, I'm in, uh, involved with dental implants now 32 years, and I've never monitored or measured the torque in surgeon talks. Never. ITI group never used in surgeon talks. They always relied on good surfaces. So there was no need for in surgeon talk because in surgeon talk has this big drawback that you cannot measure a second time. And we are mainly, for the decision when to load, we are mainly relying on the biologic anchorage of the implant. So actually, this te technique has proven that it's not the right one. It's outdated, from my point of view. 
Yeah. Hmm. So let's take another question then to see if we can have one applied to the you, Professor Moy. And this applies to, I think, the first two clinical cases. So what is the benefit of placing immediate implants in the first two cases? Very good question. Um, the benefit are many, but so are the risks. The benefits of immediate implant placement, um, from my point of view, is number one, you're allowing the socket to heal around the implant, and therefore you minimize the amount of recontouring that occurs uh, when you allow a socket to heal. Do you believe that? I do. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and we have documented cases mm -hmm, mm -hmm. measured clinically and radiographically to, to prove that. Number two, it allows faster treatment time. So instead of allowing the socket to heal, coming back and placing the implant, therefore allowing or having the tissue heal two times rather than uh, with no flap, the, there's, we feel, less tissue res, uh, recession as well. Now, that's the benefit of placing the implant right away. The other question is, what is the benefit of provisionalizing those implants? And so that is a separate issue. But that's the two main reasons why I place immediate implants. And let's suppose then that you immediately... Can I discuss that? Yes, sure. I think that's important. You see, uh, I would disagree that this should be recommended to, let's say, an audience like this. Uh, because we know from a lot of studies that when you apply this, let's say, without careful case selection, then you run a significant risk of having major recessions of the mucosa. That's why I think here the case selection is extremely important. The second case had a very thick facial wall. That's exactly what I would say that's a case for immediate implant placement. Yeah. And second, uh, you need to be extremely experienced and talented to, be, to master this technique because we have seen that. And of course, Peter, with his 35 years of experience, he is in that category, but that's not the majority of the colleagues down outside in the market. You see, that's the problem. And that's why we have seen a tons of complications with this approach when it's done by, let's say, less experienced people without careful case selection. So I, I would hate to have here a message that this is not the way to go. I think the, the literature says differently. But there have been recently two systematic reviews, uh, really exploring all the data available, the last one in 2013 by Stephen Chen and myself, and this has clearly shown that this is quite risky, as you said. Well, it's good to disagree, and uh, in fact, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Stephen Chen, mm -hmm. because in a review of three consecutive articles, he goes from one point to the complete opposite. Yeah, but you see, I mean, he's, he is probably one of the honest guys who observed in his yep. hands problems and he tried to analyze why is the problem. He has yeah. shown, for example, that uh, by very experienced clinicians in Melbourne area that uh, about 30% of these implants have been placed too far facially which is a risk in immediate implant placement. That's why you do it surgically guided, yeah. and yeah. that certainly helps to promote that. Yeah. And that's why they have gotten then the recessions. Well, that's um, where I would agree with mm, you that, mm. you know, immediate implant placement doesn't mean that you can place it regardless of what is there. Mm -hmm. I would agree that it requires careful planning, and I would agree that it would require some level of experience in managing the implant site. However, uh, I don't really see a problem when you provide the proper workup, take the proper measures to avoid recession of the labial plate, 
And as I mentioned in my presentation, the area that you need to look at is the intact labial plate, but the majority of the implants are placed on the palatal. Of course. And so, you know, with that, uh, and with the augmentation of the, of the gap, I think that you can get very, very predictable results. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. So let's say that you actually decide to immediately load than the implant on the day of surgery. What would be the protocol of ordering the temporary crown? I mean, you, I have my way of doing it slightly, and you, you sort of presented something else. Could you comment upon that, Peter? Yeah, well, I mean, I personally don't fabricate the provisional crowns, and so I work with a lot of clinicians, referrals, who um, literally come over to my practice and once the implant has been placed and we achieve the uh, ISQ uh, value of above 65, uh, they fabricate the provisional cheer side. Yep. Now that is with unguided surgical placement. With guided surgical placement that's fully guided, uh, the lab technician will take the guide and, and place the analog where the implant will end up through the guide. And from there, they make a provisional right away. Uh, because with guided, you control the positioning, the apical uh, crestal level of the implant, the tilt, the buccal lingual or buccal palatal tilt. And so you can fabricate a uh, very, very nice provisional in the lab and deliver it immediately. Yeah. And uh, to further elaborate that, as you, as you mentioned, then if you use a guide, like the cases I, I displayed, is that even with some certain implant system, you can even control the orientation of the actual hex inside the implant, which means, of course, that you can prefabricate a definitive abutment, like I showed you, and do a screw-retained or cemented restoration. And I would also like to touch upon that, because you mentioned that also in one of the cases, in terms of uh, cementing the temporary crown or using a screw-retained one. And I, I, you said that you prefer screw-retained, that's correct? Yes, yeah. that is absolutely correct. Yeah. So that's probably also something that we're seeing in terms of, as you said, picking the cases and doing these sort of slightly more difficult clinical situation because yeah, it's we, very easy to keep cement trapped. We are, we are on the conservative uh, side, of course, as yeah. we know that. And I would question, when you make a poll here, how many of these guys are doing immediately, immediately? See, I think that's not reality. You are yeah. somewhere in a, in a, I don't know, in a cloud and thinking this is the reality. <laughs> That might be Los Angeles, but that's not European <laughs> reality. See, we are going for, let's say, long-term results, and therefore I always tell my patients, if they want to have a fixed restoration as a temporary, then we give them an adhesive fixed, which is not very often. And we go normally after an extraction in at six, eight weeks, and go back with loading at six, eight weeks, so they have then 12 to 16 weeks of healing from extraction to the provisional and that's not a long time, yeah. and it's very predictable, and it's published uh, by several groups, long term, with comb beams, everything. So I think it's a very good alternative. And then patients wait, yeah, six, eight weeks before they get exposed, and then we measure ISQ, and then they go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so let's focus a little bit on, let's say, more edentulous cases then. Here's a question for you, Dr. Moy. In the full case where the ISQ values were low at insertion, do you think you would get better ISQ readings at six months with the submerged technique? Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, with the data that we have analyzed and just submitted for publication, it's uh, very apparent that with low ISQ values, if you bury the implant, and whether you wait four months, five months, six months, the integration rate is close to 100%. Yeah. And so I would say, yes, you would get uh, definitely better ISQ readings after burying the implant. You just try to avoid any pre-contact. I Correct. think that's it. Leave it alone. Yeah, and in the case where you actually did load uh, the patient, you said something about the most distal implants. Could you repeat that a little bit? Yes. Um, 
in the foliar densless where we have the benefit of cross arch stabilization and basically tripoding because you have implants in the posterior, you have implants in the anterior. Uh, I feel in, that, in those situations, if your patient wants to take that risk, um, you can immediately provisionalize because you are tying six, seven, eight implants together. Mm -hmm. And this is where I, I also disagree with Danny. Um, yes, I'm the clinician. Yes, I'm responsible for those implants. But we have to take the patient's um, desires into account. And so, you know, I understand that it's very different in America versus Europe. But if you practice in Los Angeles, I guarantee you, you can say I'm prof professor anyone, and these patients will look at you like, so? I'm happy in Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Big deal. <laughs> no, so, no. you know, I came to you because I know from reputation what you can provide for patients. Yeah, but we are talking about a fully dangerous case. I would never question that. I said we are using that if the patient benefits from immediate uh, loading, no problem. I was talking about the single tooth, and that's a different story because then the patient can eat, patient can smile, he can do everything, you see. Yeah. And then I argue with my patient, said, you see, we want to go for an, let's say, an predictable long-term result. Because in my experience, I mean, I treat a lot of patients, as you do, patients not coming and said, can you give me tomorrow a crown? He wants to have a good result that looks good and that stays there for a long time because he pays a lot of money for that treatment. And that's the argument that might be in the European side a little bit more conservative, but I think it's all a matter of discussion. And therefore, I also would be in the States in good business, I promise you. But I stay in Switzerland. <laughs> okay. So let's focus a little bit more on then towards what you were saying in your, in your technique that you were using, uh, Professor Booser. Uh, here's a question. Uh, if there is a difference in ISQ value in graft sites with use of different types of material, then you said, mentioned this slightly in, in your lecture. Yeah, I would say I'm, not, also I'm always using autogenous bone. And I'm sure this is part of the, let's say, the short healing period we have observed. Uh, and uh, then we mix it with uh, xenogenic would be the bios, eh? and the other would be an, an, uh, an uh, let's say, bone ceramic or so. But that's not a big difference. So man, uh, you measure ISQ anyhow, and then you make, it, you make the decision based on the value. Uh, I think the, 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 the winning point here is the autogenous bone chips, okay. so, as we have done for so many years. The big advantage, of course, compared to what we did 15, 20 years ago, that at that time we opened up the chin and took the grafts from the chin and the pain had a lot of morbidity from this. And about, I think, 2002 we said, yeah, we have to improve that situation. And now for all these sinuses, we are collecting the bone locally. And uh, the, these, uh, these scrapers and chisels, uh, you can go to the tuberosity sometimes. Uh, it's enough bone available. Uh, to do these kind of procedures, and then the patient has much less morbidity. Or even the ascending ramus. Yeah, yeah, There's Very exactly. little morbidity with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if you do it in two steps, how long would you wait before you will insert the, the implant? Okay, when there is not enough bone uh, to do an implant placement with sinus floor, then we normally wait five months, huh? so before we put the implant in. Uh, I ask myself sometimes if we could go in earlier, and I'm sure probably we could. If you have a lot, let's say, if you have a nice percentage of autogenous bone in there, probably you could, we could stretch it to four months, I don't know. But uh, that was not, a, let's say, an important issue. First of all, uh, in the last uh, 10 years, the percentage of staged approach procedures has been diminished, so we were able to take more risk with less bone height, so it's about 30% uh, uh, two-stage and 70% is uh, simultaneous. Okay. I thought you wanted to be conservative. Hmm? <laughs> All of a sudden you're not conservative. 
Five months? Do you wait longer? No, I'm talking about less and less bone. Yeah, but you see, with one or two millimeters of bone height, I don't think that you can do it. Huh? No. Uh, three, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. I think four millimeters is a good number. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. We I should agree. not stretch too much. Okay. <laughs> I also saw in your lecture, Professor Busa, um, when you were about to measure the ISQ actually during the surgery, uh, we discussed this, me and Peter, and there's a question sort of touching slightly upon that, but it's about the smart peg that you're using, if you can mm -hmm. use it only once, and you also talked about you changed gloves. Yes. Yeah, because of when I take the... I want to take the measurement myself, huh? yeah. Yeah. to have really nice orientation, so I take a new glove and then attach this non-sterile handle, measure it, and then give the gloves back, or to take it off again, and then take the, pe the small pack off. The small pack we are using several times in the same patient. So the consecutive readings is done with the same small pack. We all know that you cannot really sterilize it, also you could sterilize it in steam, but then the process is more expensive than the small pack. Huh? So we, we use just one small pack in that patient, disinfect it and put it in a chart and when he comes back at eight weeks I use the same small pack again and then we throw it away. Okay. That's and how it, we do that. In terms of, of the actual instrument and so say, could you touch upon that Peter? Yeah. Uh, first of all, you have to realize you you cannot sterilize the smart pay. Yeah. Please, because th that is where the magnet is and if you try to sterilize it in a steam sterilizer or a heat sterilizer, you're going to destroy <laughs> <laughs> that smart peg, so do not try to sterilize it. The, I guess you can call that the, the wand. Yeah. That wand is sterilizable. Mm -hmm. The so handle. The handle. With the, with the with cable. With the extension. Yes. Yeah. We sterilize it, and, mm -hmm. and so I have a circulating nurse that holds the, the actual machine, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we hand off the extension Okay. so that she connects it, okay. and so the, the wand is sterile, so I don't change gloves or put different gloves on. Um, the way we clean the smart peg is after using it, um, our, our assistant wipes it down with, uh, you know, uh, bacterial uh, mm -hmm. wash, and then rinses it off, dries it, and then puts it in a sterile bag and keeps it in the patient's chart. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we use that on that patient for okay. the two measurements or three measurements um, that we take on the patient. So, and as far as torquing the, the screw down, you don't need a lot of torque. Uh, I mean, no more than two Newton centimeters. Just a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hand pressure, really. Hand pressure, yes. Uh, otherwise, you're going to strip that... Um, the, the uh, male portion, and you could literally break it off inside the implant, so you, you have to be careful. You have to make sure it's tight, otherwise you're going to get a false reading, but you don't want to tighten it so much that you know, sometimes you, you twist the implant out. So. I think hand tightening is good, Yeah. because if you tighten too much, then when you try to remove it, then the whole implant comes with it. So light finger force then. Yeah. Happened to me once. And then you have to somehow, I don't know how we manage to do it, but yeah. You're yeah. getting too aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, that's what And if we focus on the actual, then let's say, uh, instrument looking more or less like an iPad today, what, what do you think is, for you, your experience, what is the biggest change in the newest generation of the Ostel IDX compared to the previous ones? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Have you tried it, Danny? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm still trying to figure out all the benefits. <laughs> There's a lot of bells and whistles on it, but what I like it the most is that it's very easy for my staff to mark where I'm measuring. Yeah. They used to do it by hand. Now it's very simple. They just hit that button and the patient's information has been inputted. And so we essentially have become paperless with our uh, um, recording of the ISQ readings. Yeah. 
I, I have not used it lately uh, because I figured out when I try to take a picture of the, of the number, then actually I cannot see the number. Mm. So that I have to find a solution that we can actually take a picture. Now I heard today they can export the JPEG of the device and if they can do that, then they are back in business. Because I want to document the case, eh, that I know the reading. Yeah. Because I, that's not enough to write it down. So I think I want to document it. Because many of these cases, we do pictures, and then it's nice to have a reading. But as you have seen, then these are the original readings of the patient taken the picture of. But I'm sure they can solve that problem. Yeah. No, it's in the cloud. It's in the cloud, yes, yeah. of course. Then it's in the chart. That's fine, of course. Yes. So we're approaching the end. Actually, we're approaching 12 o'clock. So let's yeah. pose the last question. Sorry, that was actually, I'm supposed to have this one, I think. Uh, let's see if we can have one. <laughs> That's going to be a little <laughs> bit more interesting. Well, actually, yeah. When will every dentist use Austel as a quality standard? First of all, I hope not every dentist is doing that, because then every dentist will place implants, and that's not what we want to have, because <laughs> <laughs> that is not a good thing, you see. I think when we go for quality, then uh, probably 20 to 30 percent of dentists are placing implants, and then they have enough patients to get really the experience they need to have. And if they are using the Nostel, I think that's probably uh, at the current time, for me, uh, the best objective technique to measure stability, and they can make better decisions, I guess. Yeah? Or all the patients wait too long to get restored. I mean, that's the other side. Well, that's a good closing line, actually. <laughs> 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 well, and uh, with that, I would like to thank everyone for your kind attention and taking your time being here. And of course, thank you, Professor Peter Moy and Daniel Busser. So a big round of applause. Thank you.